With that being said, this is a brother that I love to death. I love what he does. I respect his acting chops. He's one of my favorite actors, and that's why I called him. Omar Ben Samilla, how you feeling, sir? My man. I'm good. Oh, yeah, good, I'm good. All good. So, so here's the thing: we don't, we always see you in movies and 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 and, and television series and stuff, but we don't know much about you. So we're gonna start with something general, just very general to get a baseline on who you are. Favorite city you love to stay in? Favorite city I love to stay in? Yeah. Oh, I mean Los Angeles, without okay. question. Otherwise, I would move. Are you from LA? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's no other city other than L.A.? What's your favorite city other than your home city? Oh, uh, you know what? Maybe Paris, uh, maybe Miami. I like places that have uh, a mix of indoor and outdoor spaces. So, but I, I grew up in California, and so it, I, I'm really big on having uh, low humidity. So you can catch me in Miami in the winter. You can catch me in Paris in the spring and fall. And okay. you can catch me in L.A. top to bottom. So you're not a you're not a cold weather guy in at any all. Way. I, was I don't say cold I, I don't weather. want none. You're straight a hot weather guy. I'm all warm. I'd like to tan my cheeks. Okay, favorite sport? Baseball. Gun. What, what's your team? Yeah, I'm a Dodgers guy. You're a Dodgers guy all the way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What, what, from what era are you? Is this Tommy Lasorda? Is this? Uh, no, 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 no. Where you at with this? When I was a kid, I used to love the St. Louis Cardinals because my okay. mom's from St. Louis. Okay, and so from East St. Louis. Who is who is who is the team? Who are your players in, in, in when the Cardinals were hot that you liked? Oh man, I can give you the whole lineup: Ozzie Smith, Vince Coleman, Willie McGee, Ooh. Jack Clark, yeah. uh, John Tudor, Todd Worrell. You name I, Lee Smith. I, I mean, I love the Cardinals. I love that Cardinal squad. Uh, Clark was the shit. Didn't they? Didn't they take a chip? Didn't Ozzie they got a chip and they got cheated out of a chip? They got cheated out of a chip in 85 against the Royals because what ended up happening was there was a bum call. They got a, they got a bad call at home plate, and this is pre-replay. They got right. a bad call, and they got served up. But I digress. But they got them one. I want Who's, they the, got manager? Them one Who's the manager of that squad? It was, it Whitey was Herzog. It was before La Russa. Whitey Herzog. Oh, Whitey Herzog was the manager of the Cardinals? Okay. Yeah, Whitey Herzog. Okay, so you know what you're talking about. Are you a gun lover, yes or no? I mean, gun lover is just a really I, yes. I know it's a yes or no question, but gun lover is a, a tough gun, way to put gun, it. Are I, you pro guns or, or, or anti gun? I'm I am very pro responsible guns. Right, I okay. own guns. I own weapons, but I don't think they should just be wantonly available because clearly we have a problem with who gets to and who doesn't get to have guns in this country. Well, I'm a, I'm, I'm a gun owner too. I feel here's what I feel. I feel the opposite of you. I feel everybody should have a gun because it's a big ass deterrent. If Omar has a gun and I have a gun and we start arguing, we know that possibly one of us is not going home. So I notice in the places like Texas and certain places like that, you have less stuff going on because they know that anyone can be on, but it has to be responsible. I also believe that when I don't worry about the people like me and you that have a permit. Like, I worry about the guys who's getting the guns illegally, scratched off, stuff like that. Those are the people you got to worry about. The people who own guns responsibly, you know where we are. We're on, we're on record. We have fingerprints and everything. It's the guys who don't. That's my personal opinion. I'm not even worried about the guys who get it off the street and, and on the grind with the, with the weapons, to be honest. I'm more worried about the person who is mentally and emotionally unstable yeah. who has the gun. I don't yeah. care if you buy it from the guy on the corner, if you go buy it from Walmart, or if you buy it from Turner Sporting Goods or whatever. Right. I care the, about the fact that there's a lot of emotionally unstable people and mentally unbalanced people who still have access to go purchase guns. Mm -hmm. That's the problem, in, in, in my opinion. And it slips through the cracks sometimes. It's all the time, all the time. Very rarely are the gun. Very rarely are the, are the shootings that we have from the individual who actually has registered the gun, who owns the gun, so on mm -hmm. and so forth. You know, you have a you have a lot of people who got a hold of the gun from someone else, mm -hmm. but who are just mad. This is the problem with everybody having a gun. If you grow up around guns, you're gonna have a different perspective about the power of what a gun can do. Because the truth of the matter is. My gun is in the closet right now. He ain't doing nothing. He ain't right. going to hurt nobody unless right. I go pick him up and bug it out. Right. It's not like it's just, you know, it's not like it's just because. It's just going to happen. I, that's what I, I, I'm with you. Me and you to say guns don't hurt people. People hurt people. So I'm 100% with you on that. But, but people with 
that shouldn't have access to guns, who don't have proper hurt. training, who have guns, more more likely to hurt people. It's so funny when you say proper training. Most dudes in the hood shoot like this. They don't even know how to hold a gun. It, 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 like training is everything. Like all of that. When I come out there, when I come to LA. I, I, you got to take me to the range. I got to see what yeah, you got. Yeah, I was glad. You know, we got indoor ranges. We got outdoor ranges. This is the wonderful thing about having, about the, the weather. You can go shoot outside. You can shoot your long rifles. You can, you know, you, we got different angles. Okay, so I, I, when, when I come out there, I'm definitely going to come check you. Uh, mm -hmm. When I come out to see Dr. Sabi, when I go to the office and stuff, I'm going to come check you. Dream car. Dream car. Yes. Yeah. You know what? The dream car I had when I was a kid would have been a '68 Camaro uh, Z28. Right. That that was was that or the the '87 Testarossa because Don Johnson had it in Miami Vice. It was too yep. fly. Problem is, is when I got big and strong and was actually able to start copping this kind of stuff, I can't fit in nothing. They're all made for short people. They're all made for they're, they're all made for you to be you know five seven five eight. Right. And it's hard to drive supercars and this, that, and the other when you press on the steering wheel and your feet are up and, you know what I mean, it don't work right. Uh, oh, oh, do you have any old schools? Oh, yeah. What you got? I got a 66 GTO. I got an El Camino. I got a, I, I'm big on cars. I, I grew up in the car culture, so cars are a very big deal for me. Are you, are, you, are, do you, are you with Ryder Gang? Do you go with Percy and Snoop Dogg and all them dudes? Nah, I don't do all that. I For me, I... I the reason a lot of people don't know about me is because I, I roll by my lonesome for the most of the time. I'm I uh, I drive around in my convertibles. If you see me, you chunk the deuces, but chances are I keep mine low. I don't I ain't looking for no trouble. I stay out the oh, mix. Usually on Sundays, my man Percy has Percy, Snoop, Seth Entertainer, Exhibit. All these guys do Rider Gang, which is like a car show. They bring yeah. their cars out and they do their thing like that. I thought you would be into that. Um, one thing that you're scared of. Oh man, uh, uh, losing peace easily. I mean, it, it, peace is what it's all about. And for me, if I if something makes me lose my peace, if it can disturb me enough to get me out of my zone to lose my peace, anything can happen. I don't want to get to that point. No good. What album that you consider a classic and why? Well, any genre. Any genre, man. Anything you want, classic. Uh, Prince, Sign of the Times. I wow. remember when I was a kid, I remember when the double CD came out for the first, I think that was the first album that we had both on hard vinyl and on a CD, and it was a double, and the range of music on that album, if you listen to it, the range of music on those two different uh, CDs is unreal. The depth of the music, the kind of music that I grew up to that put me in a position to to actually think think about the opposite sex and how I felt about them. To, to think about notes of music. I was in the band at the time, mm -hmm. you know, to, to connect how I felt with what I'm hearing. And it's, you know, a lot of it is well more advanced than I was age-wise when I was a kid, but it was, you know, I still rock it to this day. West Coast classic rap album. Uh, I mean, The Chronic is the ultimate. Of course. That, that's, not even, that's not even in question. But uh, honestly, you know what else I love? Dre is included in that too, but it's the Easy E Easy Does It album, mm. or the Dog Pound Dog Food album, which I think mm -hmm. is really underrated. If you go that Dog Pound Dog Food album, Daz and Corrupt on there with Snoop is also in there. It's tremendous, and Doggies. I mean, that whole era. If you put Dre's fingertips on it from the late '80s to the mid '90s, it. you're hard pressed to lose. Killed it, and, and, and you know something. The one thing that I think about is, um, I, I think it's either. I forget whose cousin it is. That cat, RBX, he was on one record, C Serial Killer. Oh, man. I never heard him again. I, I, I always wondered, where did this guy go? Because he was fine. Deep. Deep like the minds of my... No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> picture this. Now picture this. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he was a monster. He was, he was a monster. Um, uh, favorite rapper? Oh, man. Wow. I don't know. This is hard to go with just one. It really give me, is. Give me, give me, give me your five. Five favorite rappers. Five top rappers to you. I'm going with Snoop. Uh, I'm going with man. You you want five, huh? I'm going with Snoop. I gotta go. I gotta go with Jigga in there. Two. Um. Mm, man, 
I always want to put Biggie in there, but his sample size is so small. But if we just go in with what we have, it's hard to not have Biggie in the joint. It, you, you have to, when you think of Biggie, you have to think of what was going to happen next. Yeah, yeah, no, you're giving him, and you're giving him credit on potential, which is tough. Yeah, but listen, listen, Omar, Ready to Die was good. Ready to Die was great. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Ready to Die was good. But Life After Death was even better. It's very agree, rare. But it's very rare for you to get better with your, your sophomore album. album. I agree. Most of the time, cats don't got nothing to say it, at all it, by the second album. So think about it this way: If Ready to Die was good, Life After Death double CD, you can count that as two. That's two and three. What would what would his third album be like? See, but Ooh, you don't know. Good. That's the issue. You don't know because. Things change in people's lives. He was a special dude, and he was so young, but he had a way to interpret what was happening in his life and still make it relevant, as opposed to a lot of guys, you got, you know, 25 years to make your first album worth of material. And then if it's hot, they want that second one right back, and you don't really got nothing to talk about. So, he, you know. He did it. That's why. That's so he why did I that. He did that. It was, he did it. Tupac had a lot of work for us to look at, so when people put the Tupac in there, that is warranted because he had he had a lot. He of had work. the body of work to on volume. He had the body of work. And speaking of that as well, I mean, it's super. Uh, a lot of people won't understand unless you grew up with it. But this is how I feel about E Forty. Man, you, it's so much material. The man has so much slang and so much swagger. He's real, real hard to beat. So you would look put, at the whole catalog. You would say, you would say, uh, Dre hold. You, you put forty in there. You put forty one. No, I said Snoop. Oh, Snoop, the right Dre. You said Snoop. You said Jigger. I said I, who else? I, Who's you got You got to go Biggie. I'm going E forty. And I mean, we could we could round out the top, even though he tripped out on me with this Trump support. But you can round out the top. I, to me, Ice Cube is real hard to beat. Yeah, Ice Cube is hard to beat. And, and you know something? I don't think that. Cube was a supporter. Cube, when I look at that, it was like Cube was speaking, he was speaking truth to power. He was like, yo, you're going to have to fuck with us. If you get in here, you're going to have to deal with us. I didn't think that, in my opinion, I didn't look at him like he was kowtowing the Trump. I don't see, and I know Cube and you know Cube, I don't see Cube kowtowing to nobody. He brought his proposal to the table. He said, now y'all deal with me. Well, you're giving him a, a lot of love. I don't know. I didn't read that way to me. But if we're just talking about rappers and his influence on rap, man, he was a monster for a oh, long time. Come on, this this man was giving you no Vaseline. He was giving you like he was giving you all. Listen, the de the part. death certificate album. You want to talk about a West Coast classic? That death certificate album. You can just press play and keep it moving. It's fantastic to this day. The whole the whole thing through. It's very few uh, rap albums. That you can play. That you can just hit play and run it. Yeah, I agree. Exactly. Even the sketches, even even the little skits have something to say. Mm -hmm. That but see, that's when people, that's when rappers used to put an album together, a, a concept, a, a rolling theme, and and like Dre and all of them, they learned that through Dre and 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 all of those albums of that period from those uh, those crew of guys all had that cohesive theme, and that that was that was one of the things that. I loved about that era of West Coast hip hop. As far as you being an actor, what was the first time you thought about acting? Oh man, you know what? I had a, I was in school. I went to school in the Bay Area, and uh, I had a barbecue at the house. And afterwards, a couple of ladies stayed back and helped me clean up. And I was cleaning up the house and blah blah blah. And they were like, "Man, you're a really good host. You should think about acting." And it was the first time that I ever thought that you could actually tie in just being charismatic to actually ending up on camera. Mm. And I remember they, everybody left and I was sitting back. I told my man Flexus, I was watching Homeboys in Outer Space and I, it was on TV. And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, man, I could do that. I could do that. Wow. And at the time I had just stopped playing baseball. I had just stopped playing sports and I was trying to find my way. And thank God it was a professor, a brother actually, who brought me into the theater and taught me the craft and actually taught me about acting and taught me the importance of these things. It was, and the importance of being good, you know, and he just passed away. The brother's name was Buddy Butler. He just wow. passed away in January, man. That man changed my life. And then things started rolling after that. Things started so, really happening. 
So just just right out of school, you kind of hop into the acting thing. This this is a profession. Acting is a profession to me. I can only say this on the outside, being a musical guy, but understanding entertainment in general. It's a profession that's based on a couple of different things. Being what they think you should look like. Slim, white, you know, that kind of stuff. Did you ever worry about getting roles when, when, when you were going out here to do this? Because people like me, you, we not what they quote unquote looking for. How, how, did, you, how did you handle that? I never worried about that. In all honesty, if anything, I worried about doing too much. I never had a confidence issue. I, I've had great role models and heroes in my life from the time I was a kid, and they built me up real good. They loved me up. So I, I, I always believed that when I set my mind to something, I could do it. For me, I was concerned with getting typecast as one type. Mm -hmm. And my whole life, I had been an underdog, whether I was playing sports or in class or anything else. And so for me, once I had the opportunity to try to go put it down, I was more concerned with only getting stuck. Because back then, when I was first starting, you either did TV or you did movies. And usually, if you were on TV, you weren't any good. And if you were in movies, you were good, but you might not make any money. It was a real tricky conundrum. And what ended up happening was I got blessed straight off the bat uh, with the audition for 8 Mile. And the movie changed my life. Right on. Changed my life. Now, 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 how do you, because we're going to go to 8 Mile in a minute. How do you get, quote, unquote, typecast? How do you get caught in that? What, what, what gets you caught in that? I think there's a couple different ways it can go. In all honesty, I think one way is, is you can be too good at one thing. You can play one role so well that they then in turn put you in a spot where they think this is all you can do. And if you're really good at that one thing, the first time people see you, first impressions are real. Mm -hmm. And the first time people see you, if they see you in a role that they can't unsee you in, this, this can be a problem. The other way is, is you accept the same role over and over again. Hollywood has this thing once that they know you can do something. Mm -hmm. They want you to keep doing that. If a director directs, I remember talking to Spike Lee and he was like, when, when he did Inside Man, he got a, a thousand bank heist scripts. So I, I just did the bank heist movie, man. I don't, I'm not looking for another bank heist movie to do. Mm -hmm. And so you have to have the discipline to say no a lot of the times. And that has a lot to do with you not getting typecast and also to avail yourself to a toolbox so that you can be seen in different ways. Mm -hmm. So that you're not always seen as the very same person. You know what I mean? No, I think no. that's a big deal. The look is important and it's not because, see, acting is a craft and it takes all types. When you watch the movie, there's old people in the movie, there's kids in the movie, there's, a, there's every range in between. Obviously, they got some diversity issues, but in, uh, uh, without question, you can do this for your entire life at different phases on different platforms. Yeah, mm -hmm. they might not want to make you the sexiest man alive when, you, you know, when you're 75, or when you're 17, but you could still work. And being good and doing the work is just, there's no substitute. Did you ever experience size discrimination? Because of your oh, I'm, you I'm sure, I'm sure. I'm sure and I don't even know about it. This game is so tricky. They can just tell you, hey, we're going a different direction. And they could close the door and be like, man, this fat ass, he thought we was gonna hire him, never. You know, there's a, there's a million different ways that they can discriminate and all through, you know, there's no, it's not like somebody you can call to say I was discriminated against because mm -hmm. it's a subjective business. It's subjective to the opinion of the individuals who hire people. Right. So it's, it's not like a, uh, it's not like a job that is like a more practical job to say, yes, I can do this. A scoop can do this. This person can do this. And we have three positions to fill. Sometimes the way that you look is important. I, I can tell you a story. I'll tell you what they told me, what the producer and the director of 8 Mile told me, which was uh, they almost didn't hire me because they thought I might be too tall to be in the scenes with Marshall. Hmm. And wow. so th there's been plenty of times where I'm too tall for the joint, let alone too wide. You know, there, there's, there's stuff where a lot of actors are little dudes. A lot of wow. actors are coming in at 5'6", five, 5'7", five, and, and when they're trying to frame us both in the frame, they don't Can't want to do it like this. And so right, they're like, right. yeah, man, look, you know? Right. What are the three things that an actor needs to get and keep work? Persistence is job one. 
You, you need to be persistent. You have to have a, the tenacity to not stop. So that regardless, it's a failure business. Mm. And it's a failure sport, just like it's part of the reason that it works out well for me is because I grew up playing baseball and baseball too is a failure sport. You fail more times than you succeed in baseball. It's right. not like, a, say, like a basketball where you get to shoot 30 shots a game and this, that, and the other, you know? No, you, you don't get – I don't get a lot of auditions. You don't get a lot of opportunities. you got to take advantage of those opportunities. So I think that all actors need persistence. You have to have the that – it has to be something that you need to do because if not, it's going to discourage you into not doing anything. So you don't get a lot of auditions? I don't get a lot. I've never gotten a lot of auditions. Then that's based on how I look more so than what I can do. I've never gotten a lot of audition. I just have a very high conversion rate. At this point, most of the stuff I do, people know me or want me to do something because of X, Y, and Z. But, you know, I still audition for stuff. And I don't mind auditioning, really, because if it's something they haven't seen me do, then that's great. That's another, that's another believer I got to make. What what is the strangest thing that's ever happened in, our, in an audition? You haven't had that many, but what's the strangest thing that happened that made you go? Wow, you know what? I was I, I remember one time something that really made me trip out was was when I was auditioning for uh, I was I was gonna be originally I was gonna be Fat Albert. When, okay. when Forrest Whitaker was going to direct Fat Albert, mm -hmm. way on back, before they actually made the movie with Keenan. And uh, that process put me in the spot. We were all, we were like a week away from shooting or something like that, and the whole thing fell apart and blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. So I had had history with some of the people that were the higher-ups at that, that studio at the time for casting. And I went in, actually, I sent in an audition tape for that movie, The Blind Side. Mm -hmm. Everybody seems to think that it was me when it's Quentin. And I, that's when I was out working in Italy with Spike. Well, the director wanted to meet me, so I came back in and met with the director. And we were having a good session. We did a take and we did, you know, did the piece. Next thing you know, <laughs> next thing you know, somebody in the room, a random, I, they say he was an executive, but I don't know, a rando in the room gave me notes on the performance that it wasn't his place to give the notes. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm good, man. <laughs> the director's right here, so he, he can let me know. It was right. at that moment I knew I wasn't getting the job. Right, right. Because a lot of the times when you're in the room or when you're not in the room and you send your tape, there's a lot of people who have just enough juice to salt you up, but mm -hmm. they don't have enough juice to hire you. Right, right, right. Those people are very bitter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that that's the that's probably the most bizarre thing other than I remember going on an audition one time and I completely lost the ability to speak. I mean, I talked for a living and I went in and I had a line. I was like, I, did, I, did. I just left. <laughs> I literally, I just I said, I said, you know what guys, I'm sorry. And I just left. I walked out. Wow. It was very bizarre. And I don't know what happened that day, but something my, my mouth wouldn't work. Wow. And, and, and you know something, uh, anything with TV, and auditioning, everybody got notes. Everybody, Every, everybody, you know, when I had my TV show on MTV, man, I was getting notes from everywhere. And I was yeah. the EP, and I was getting notes, still getting notes. Oh, I got notes about this, I got notes about that, so I understand. Um, top five actors that you can go to for help if you need it. Oh, wow. You know what? I, I run with a circle of actors that, that is mostly people that you've seen me in the movies with mm -hmm. that I feel the same way about the work that they do. Mm -hmm. I go talk to my man, Evan Jones, that played Cheddar Bob in Eight Mile. Mm -hmm. I can go talk to my man, Walton Goggins, that I'm on the unicorn with right now on CBS. Mm -hmm. uh, I go talk to my man, Mike Ely. Mike has a okay. great perspective. Mike Ely, Mike's in excellence. Okay, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but all black nonetheless. Right, right. Uh, I talk. I talk with my man, uh, uh, my man Marquise Harris. I, I talk to my man Tory Kittles. I, it's a it's a handful of people. I don't actually solicit a lot of advice, even if I'm having a hard time, because I don't trust the work. You know, I have to trust your opinion, 
and I don't really trust the opinion of a lot of people when it comes to acting. Wow. With that being said, who are the actors that you really trust? Would you trust a Denzel Washington? Who, 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 would, you, who would you just write off the rip say, oh my God, yeah, I, I trust you? Yeah, I mean, how can you not trust Denzel Washington? The guy, you know, is the, he's easily the greatest movie star of, uh, of, of that I was in my generation, he, he, you know. But it's a, it's a different thing because the guys that you're going to go talk to are a different, everybody, actors are really particular people. So the way that they talk and who you talk to is also somewhat guarded. I, I try to get a variety of, of perspective, uh, but also I have to know what you like. Because if you're trying to tell me something is dope that I think is whack, then I'm not going to ask you about nothing. I have a, a very small circle of people that I talk to about the material and about stuff that we watch that we don't even talk about publicly because if if the public saw us and the stuff we were saying, some people would take it the wrong way. And this is and this is peer to peer stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure people do the same with me. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Definitely. Oh. Uh, actor, actor that taught you the most about the game. The person who put you on taught, taught you the most about the game, hands down. Hands down, Mackay Pfeiffer. Wow. Okay. Without question. And why Without is question. that? Why? Because he laced me up when I first got on. He laced me up and we were doing eight mile and he turned me on to so much information about the game, not about the craft of acting per se, but about the game, about, you know, hey, this is how it works in Hollywood. And then this is what they try to do. And then you respond like this. This is what happens when people start recognizing you. All right, this is how you move in this situation. There was so much. He was so much advanced. When, by the time I met him, he was so much farther down the road than I was, you know what I mean? He was already on. I had been watching him in the movie theater by the time I actually met him. Mm -hmm. And so he had game and he was he was real free with sharing it with me and I appreciate that. I just told him that the other day. I really appreciate that because mm -hmm. he could have kept he could have kept it to himself. And not nah, he shared information that he had which then in turn prepared me for the success that I was about to have. Mm -hmm. so, and, and, then, and now you'll pass that on to other people. I do it all the time. I yeah, do it before, all the time. Before I get you out of here, three three things that I want to talk about. Three people: Eight Mile, Ballers, and CSI. Working man, with those are, those those are heavy hitters. There, those are the big ones. Working with Eminem, he said has a relentless work ethic, almost to the point of when it where it's like, you know what the the through line on those three things. One thing that I've learned about people who are mega famous like beyond, like super mega stars, the work ethic is always there. These people go morning to night without breaks and they have a hyper focus on this one thing that they're doing. For Marshall, it was the music. In between takes, he would have people come over and pass him a notebook and he would be writing lyrics. You might just stand, you might be sitting around talking about my coffee cup, my coffee cup, my coffee smudge, my dodo lush, and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, wow. All right, man, calm down. But it was it was admirable because he had his music trailer on set. He had his gym on set. He had the stuff that he needed to keep himself going to work at that high level on set. One day we shot 18 hours and then he went and did a show with D12 at the Fox Theater. And I'll never forget it. It was right around Thanksgiving. I was like, man, this dude is an animal. Same with uh, Same with The Rock, man. The Rock's work ethic is, I mean, you see it because he puts his out there. But even seeing it, the guy gets a lot packed into his 24 hours, you know? And this is one thing that I take from all of the, like, the mega star people that I've worked with. They get a lot done with their time. There's not a lot of, there's not a lot of downtime. There's not a lot of free time and socializing and whatnot because they're building something. Or if they've already built it, then they're maintaining something. One thing that I've learned about older people who are have already been really successful is they take the time to enjoy what they're doing. And some of the younger people that are really successful are just so intense and relentless on what it is that they're they're building. So that would say that about eight mile. Wow. When it comes to CSI Miami, CSI Miami changed my life because this availed me to the power of television. Prior to that show, I'd never really done much television. And if I did it, I'd do an episode here or there. I'd never really done it for a longer period. Hey, man, I get off the plane anywhere in the world. People know me now. 
and that has a lot to do with CSI Miami. It has a lot to do with my entire body of work, but it has a lot to do with CSI Miami. Because what, and, and what is the what is the difference? Because CSI Miami and the CSI franchise and just Unicorn, anything with CBS, CBS is the number one, the number one network in the country, whether it's my man L with NCIS, you know, I, and I talk to L about that all the time. Like NCIS is one of my favorite shows. Uh, CSI is one of my favorite shows. Of course, you got you, you got a bunch of different shows on there. Uh, CLT Six, all that. What are the perks of being on one of the top shows in the country and being in that big Viacom system? You know, opportunity is the main perk. You have the opportunity. To, to get other work within the family of companies of that giant mega corporation. I'm, I, bro, I do the unicorn on CBS. I do, uh, I do the voice of one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on Nickelodeon. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I do stuff, I, I'm, I do stuff within the body of Viacom mm -hmm. where I'm sure they may not call me and say one hand is talking to another. And there's some other stuff that's getting announced. As a matter of fact, on Thursday that you guys will see. But they're all working in unison. So they're there. When you get mega corporations like that and, and that kind of structure that's set up on your side, the machine can really, really work for you. Now, the other thing that it does that is, in my opinion, one of the greatest perks is that it's a platform. You know, you have a platform to, to get the word out for whatever it is that you care about, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and because eyes are on you, believe that. And, and when it comes to like a, a CBS, man, it's, you know, five, six million people watching me a week. That's just on that show. That's not on Netflix and, and Amazon and anywhere else you might catch me on YouTube. That's just on that show. That's a lot of eyes, man. That's a very serious platform to do something with. And this is why I'm, I'm always try to keep mine positive. I try to bring the light to the situation because that darkness is pervasive, man. And this is why we have to be so careful about the, what comes out of our mouth. Uh, uh, we, we have to be so careful about how we talk about ourselves, you know? And I, I'm, I'm saying that as a, about the culture, but I'm saying that about each individual. When you talk about yourself in a way that can be construed or is negative, don't be surprised when negative things come around. That's how it works. This is a, this is how the law of attraction works. Oh, oh now we're talking about Napoleon Hill. Now we're talking about reaping and sowing works. You know, it's biblical. These are spiritual laws that take place well beyond what you can see with your own eyes. You know, so wow. there's a lot of perks on being involved on the on the high level in the big leagues. Final question, man. Um, well, it's actually two. One is what would your dream role be, and number two for me in music. Before it's over, I want to do a record with Mary J. Blige. Never did a record with oh, Mary Oh, wow. Nice. I, I got to get that. Wow. Number That's awesome. Is, yeah, I, I'm, I'm working on that. Number one is a dream role. And number two is, who is the actor that you want to work with before you call this a career? Oh, man. You know, they're so... They, I, I had dream roles when I was younger. And now I'm interested in creating as as maybe as as vague as that sounds i'm interested i don't know what the dream role is yet because i haven't written it and i can remember when i was younger literally my dream role i read the novel miracle saint anna and it was my dream role to play sam train in miracle saint anna and spike gave me that opportunity and i lost 70 75 pounds to be in that film that was the condition for spike to hire me and i lost 60 mm. pounds over a summer to be in the movie because I, in the movie that I was doing when I got the job, I was mm. a football player in the express and uh, yeah, man. And it, it, and that it's so, it's so fulfilling when something like that happens, you know, it's like when you finally get to take the, the girl of your dreams out on a date, mm -hmm. it's like, you know what I mean? And you to have something so clear to say it's Mary J. Blige. I want that, especially with all the success <laughs> you've had, man. It's awesome to, it's, it's awesome to have one thing like that. As far as actors that I want to work with, man, there's so many of them. And I, I hate to say it, but they're, they're peeling off, you know, left and right, man. I mean, you saw we lost the great Yafit Koto uh, uh, early this morning, <laughs> last night. Yeah, 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 last night. 
I mean, he's retired, but, but uh, you know, you got Sidney Poitier out there. You got, there's so many people, there's so many great actors who, who I watch and I'm like, oh, foreign people. You know, one of my goals is I really want to start making movies in other languages. And I want to I want to get my foreign tongues up so that I could actually vibe and improvise and perform in other languages. And I really want to challenge myself to do that before it's all said and done. No, no, so, no, that, that's so that isn't even like the dudes from England sounded like changing their accent to be American in Snowfall. That's a whole different language. Like that's a whole different level of, of training, man. That's like. I gotta go learn Italian, be fluent in Italian, and then go, <laughs> go go and get it, man. That's a that's a high that's a high goal to reach for. But you, one thing that you said is you you from what I can gather, you're a student of the law of attraction, the Napoleon Hill, you know all of that stuff, and you you manifested exactly what you wanted in your life, and that's why it's happening. What came out of your mouth is actually what happened. It's insane. And it was my brother. And that for me, it comes from a biblical space because this is the, most of these tenets that people write about in the books of, you know, the, the, the truths, if you will, of these different things are they're all found in the Bible. And there's some remix or interpolation of stuff that's in the word, like the laws of reaping and sowing and uh, attraction and manifestation and this that, and the other. Sorry, man, it's getting dark in here. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, it's a trip. My brother passed away in 2016. One of my brothers wow. passed away. Wow. And we were always, always together. And one day, we actually had an office on the studio lot. And I remember we drove up and we went in, we took our stuff, we were going in to do our work in the office. And when he looked at me, he said, you did it. I said, I did what? He said, we just drove on and you got in. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you know what? When you first started acting, you called me when you were in college and you said, one of these days, I'm going to come to the studio and they're just going to know me. They're not going to ask for your ID or nothing like that. And they're just going to know you and, and rub you on. He goes, and, it, and we just did it. And it was one of those moments where it's like, wow, the game that of life in general is such a long-term game, you know? <laughs> and we get caught up, I think, I know I do sometimes, we get caught up in feeling like it's just now. And in the in the sprint portion of the race, and this thing really, it's a real life is the marathon. It really is because you, if you're blessed to get more time, you really got to plant seeds. You got to water them. You got to give them sun. You got to watch them grow. You can't just you know. You can't just think everything is right now. Part of the issue I think, and how we get tricked on that is we're in the middle of this instant gratification of social media and technology. People like you and I grew up where everything took longer. I hate to sound like the old man, but awesome. everything took longer and it actually made you much more patient. I find myself, even though I grew up like that, I find myself, I'm sure you do too, even feeling in that same way where it's like, you know what, let me slow down. And if there's any good that came out of the quarantine and the pandemic is that it made, made me slow down. I got more rest than I've gotten in so long. You know, I took a flight for the first time the other day in the pandemic, man. It, it was like I was a little kid. I got on the plane. Look, look at this little plane is taking off. This is wild. Well, you know what I mean? And it was like simple joys. I got into gardening. I cook a lot now. There ain't nobody out there that can air fry some chicken better than me. I'm okay. Like doing okay. this. And so it's like, you okay. know, simple, simple joys in life. Well, I hung out with my mom. So my mom's about to turn 79. You know, she she planted some broccoli in the yard. It's little stuff, man. And it's all long term. And that stuff is going to manifest itself in some sort of positivity and joy in my life down the road. Mm -hmm. Might not be tomorrow. Might not be for 20 years. But it's going to happen. You have to have that faith. It, you know? You know, it, and I'll leave you on this note, bro. A couple of different things. Number one, because we talk, we think the same way and we talk the same way. Everybody wants it now. They want they want the fame, but they don't want to put in the work. You you want to do what it is what it takes to be number one, but you want to do that while playing around. Like you said, the the mega achievers they work there every day. Man, should I get up most days at three thirty in the morning just to do everything that I need to do? Um, you know, even though the the pandemic was painful for me, because remember my business is predicated upon people, so that's it. So 
Um, the day before yesterday marks the day that I came home from England and I haven't worked. Now, I got lucky. I was doing, I, you know, did YG records, records with EDM groups and stuff. I got, I got a little check, but not my check that I'm used to. Yeah. But it was a reorganization. Yes, because things are changing and right. you had to adjust. Right. And, and, and in the reorganization of everything, I wound up paying my alimony off. I wound up doing certain things that if I play my cards right when the lights come back on, I'm going to be straight. Now, there's always going to be pain before the pleasure. And I looked at this as, as an intense point of pain, but I, now that I'm looking back and saying, Egypt just called me to do a show. So and so, England, I, I mean, uh, 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 Barbados, I mean, Barbados called me to do a show. I got a show in Texas. It's not coming in like it. Like, I'll tell you, for me, I work 49 weeks a year for 26 years straight. Wow. 49. And, and that's not, that's not, that's not LA to Arizona flights. That's going back and forth, just doing a bunch of things overseas because that's where I, that's where my business is. That's where you get your cake. I guess. That's where I get my cake. But this allowed me to slow down, get my health together, get my mind together. It was painful. But if I do the right things on the other side, I'm going to come out where I need to be. Thank you very much, brother. You know I love you. It's all and love. We got to have, we got to talk on the other side because we. But real quick, for the, people, for the people out there watching, man, listen to what you just said. You could have spun that any number of ways that could have been destructive. Mm -hmm. But because you chose to take the perspective of positivity in that, of the reorganization, it allows you the hope to keep your peace so that you don't jump off the balcony. And mm -hmm. so that you are saying, nah, I'm ready. And I'm going to be ready. When they flip the switch, they're going to still need me out there because I'm ready. Yo, I pivoted this. I pivoted just doing Instagram. Friday is the year anniversary of me, of, of me doing a daily Instagram show. It's now awesome, people, man. Now people are calling me about radio shows and morning shows and stuff like that. You have to pivot immediately. When there's a problem, you can't sit. You got to pivot or you're going to die. So with that, yeah, means, thank I you. you. I love you, man. I love you too. Thanks for having me, Scoop. I catch you, you bro. We'll talk later. God bless. Peace. Uh, man, that's my man, Omar Benson Miller. Just knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. And that man, Scoop. Visit FatManScoop.com to buy merch. Go to FatManScoop on Instagram TV or YouTube to see the full interview.